So very warm welcome to Philosophy Live. My name is Christine Lambie. I'm a student and a tutor in the School of Philosophy and Economic Science. Now, today we are talking about Julian of Norwich, who lived between 1342 and 1416, so a, a long time ago. She was an anchoress, which is to say she was walled into a very small cell attached to St. Julian's Church. Now, 650 years ago, almost to the day in May 1373, at around 30 years old, she was seriously critically ill. And she had 16 visions or showings, which have now been written down, which she wrote down as revelations of divine love. Now, recently a book was published called I, Julian, which I'm really delighted to recommend. It's a fictional autobiography of Julian of Norwich. Uh, I think this is a great read. It's quite a page turner. And uh, today I'm really delighted to introduce Claire Gilbert, who is the author of this book, and she is here for today's interview. So, Claire, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks very much for joining us. Uh, I wonder if you could start just by telling us a little bit more about Julian. Uh, you have actually given us pretty much all that we know, and even that's a bit speculative. It's a rather charming fact about her that she is almost invisible. All we have is her wonderful text and what we might understand about her from the text that she wrote about her visions. But she said she had her visions when she was 30, so we can guess that she was born in uh, 1342 uh, and uh, 30 and a half, so... Uh, uh, and and there are legacies which go as, as late as 1416. So she apparently lived to a ripe old age. Um, and we imagine entered the anchor hold after she had her visions because mm -hmm. the description in the visions has her in a bedroom with her mother and not clearly not in an anchor hold. Uh, so, so we imagine that she went into the anchor hold in order to be alone and make sense of what this extraordinary thing that she, she'd seen and perhaps she wrote there. It wasn't particularly safe as a woman to write or indeed have visions that didn't exactly tally with the teaching of holy church as she calls it uh, so going into an anchor hold might have been a place of safety as much as anything else for her right and she was the first woman to write in english wasn't she yes uh, which is an incredible uh, fact about her really mm. so um i wonder you you've created this autobiography which i, I think is absolutely fantastic would you like to just read us a section yes so this is the moment just after the funeral service is held that that buries her in her anchor hold. It's her, she's died to the world. The door has been bricked up. Stillness. There is a quiet rustling of clothes as the people leave the church, then the thin cry of a baby. The cry leaves the church with the people and the silence returns. I stand up and face my cell, my coffin, my small home. I have never felt so fully alive. I am not expecting this. I was expecting to feel tortured by confinement at this moment, as the portal is bricked up, the walls pressing upon me, my breath short and shallow and panic only just kept under control. But the panic I felt when I first entered has gone. At last, at last, I am alone. At last, I can ask the world to recede, and it will. So much space, just for me. Space and time and strength for the long, slow, interior journey deep into God. God deep into me. I have come home. That is absolutely fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> um, I'll just say here, we are going to take some questions from viewers. So if you have a question, please put it in the chat. So let me ask you, you've created this work of extremely plausible uh, fiction. How did you get so close to Julian to create this? 
she, I've loved her ever since I was an undergraduate when she was the bright star in my dry as dust Oxford theology degree. She stood out, she didn't try to organize God and I loved her then. And then later I wrote a doctoral thesis on her in relation to the environment. <clears throat> and, and after that was all over, I got cancer and she stopped being the subject of my academic study and became my spiritual companion through two and a half years of really grueling treatment. And as I emerged from the treatment, I honestly, it was like this. I heard a call to tell her story with the same voice that I'd discovered in writing about the cancer um, in, in the book, Miles to Go Before I Sleep. It was in, I've written other things, but this is the truest I've ever, ever been. And the call was to tell her story with that same truth. And so it had to be in the first person. And it really did feel audacious uh, because she is elusive. She, she And she says in her revelations, don't look at me. Don't look at me. Look at what I saw. See directly what I saw. Um, but as if I could put it like this, she let me. She let me write it. And it poured out of me. But I suppose I knew the text very, very well. I had to bone up on the, um, so I had to study uh, the period so mm. that I could make it, make it plausible. And, and as far as, and what facts there were uh, uh, that we know were, were in there. So there are real historical characters. But um, there's, a, there's something about the creative process, I think, that means you can almost be more truthful than the just telling the facts, the dates. The dates don't really tell you much at all, do they? But it, of course, it's my own imagining. Of course it is. And, and you probably can't tell, or well, I can't quite tell where Julian stops and I start. I got that close to her. And that was actually what I felt. It was like the two of you fused together. And I, having known you for many years, I, I could see things from your own life, but you got so close. Yes. Uh, or, or perhaps you're the same person. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, if I can drop a name, I did a gig with Jeremy Irons on this. And he said that reading it, it reminded him of when he acts. He says, say he's playing King Lear. He will study and study and study the character. And then he'll let go of all the study and then he'll act and he doesn't know where Jeremy Iron stops and King Lear starts. Mm. They do just become one in the acting. So it was very interesting to have that uh, comparison. Yeah, yeah. And um, we know uh, Julian for a religious figure. She's associated more with religion. Is there any sense in which you see her as a philosopher? In the, in the 14th century, you wouldn't have just been able to distinguish between philosophy and religion, I'd say. Uh, uh, and if philosophy is love of wisdom, then she and she loves God. She speaks of God, our mother, as all wisdom. Uh, and the other thing is, if philosophy is inquiry, she is certainly an inquirer. She, while she's having the visions and then afterwards as she's writing about them, she goes back and back and back to them and looks ever more deeply at them to find the truth that's in them. So I'd say she's a philosopher. Excellent. Uh, let's take a question here. Uh, Nicholas, thank you, Claire. Would you say she was genuinely enlightened? Was she one with God? Well, she wouldn't use that language. Um, she speaks about, so she speaks about prayer. She speaks a lot about prayer and how sometimes your prayer is dry as dust and you just, you, you seek God, you seek God, you seek God. And then sometimes there isn't, there is only God. And she, but she says both those forms of prayer are equally valid. Yes, I, I wonder also, maybe I can just go on from that. She kind of found her own way. The way she refers to Jesus as the mother is, is very surprising. Would you like to comment on that? Um, well, well, the thing about Julian is she, she had these visions and this is what she saw and what she sees doesn't always accord with what holy church teaches but she and this is this is so mature she mm. doesn't emphasize either either one of those in order to make her world neat and tidy that's a that's a I, that very much speaks into the 21st century of um thinking we, we though there's only one one truth and it's my truth and your truth because it doesn't agree with my truth simply can't be true and she she has both in her, in her mind at the same time. And she doesn't jettison either. And there's a sense in which her understanding grows by doing that. So seeing Jesus as mother, I mean, it, uh, um, 
Oh, there's so much to say about this. <laughs> and God as mother, but the love of a mother, um, the love of a mother which never, ever, ever changes. It doesn't matter what the child does. Uh, there's no condition set on the love. And, and I think we, could, we speak about the unconditional love of God or the unconditional love of Christ. And we can understand it in imagining this love of a mother which doesn't change. You know, in prison, it's the mothers who keep going to see their sons and don't give up on them. That's, I mean, it's not universal, but it's pretty much the trend. So, uh, and, and she sees that God is whole, everything that is made is held by, by God's love. So God cannot be wrath, because if God were wrath for one moment, the whole of creation would fall. It's held by love. So, and that love is the Yes. Thank you. Now, um, with the coronation recently, there was a screen when Charles was anointed, King Charles. And on the screen, I noticed it said, all shall be well, and all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well. And I was delighted to see a big quote from Julian in such a promising place. I wonder if you'd like to just say, I mean, patently, all is not well at one level. <laughs> Would you like to just say perhaps what what did she mean or what was she saying? What was she telling us with that with that phrase? It, so God said this to her, and He said, "You you will see that I will make all things well. You it, you can't see it now, but you will see it." And she repeats it in trust, if you like, that that is the case. Uh, but I I my sense of her understanding of it is that she encountered a great deal of pain and trouble. The, the troubles of the 14th century were not a million miles from the troubles of the 21st century, mm -hmm. plague and war and famine and want and social unrest. And she and she had her own personal experience of that and she walked towards it. This is what she taught me with my cancer. You walk towards it, you don't push it away or fight it and you become porous to it, you walk through it and joy emerges. Wow. Yes, thank you. I, I was going to ask you about that um, also. How how much do you feel you have joined her spiritual experience? I didn't, I have never had visions like she had, and I didn't have them when I was writing about the book. But when mm. I was writing the book, in the act of writing the book, I was, I was, I was reenacting them. So they did come to life within me in order mm -hmm. to write about them in a way that was as compelling or hopefully as compelling as the way she writes about them in Revelations of Divine Love. Uh, so, yes, I do. I do feel very close to her. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, but it's the it's the way that she approaches things that that is so instructive. And I think that was what teaches us about the ecological crisis, because the way she responds is she receives and participates and is porous to and learns from. And I feel that's our, that's the call to us to respond to nature now, to not to try and control it and be in charge of it, but to learn from it and to be in service of it. Yes. I've got a couple of people saying, what is the name of the book? So I'm just gonna hold this up again. The name of the book is I, Julian. And uh, I, this is easily available on Amazon. Is that right, Claire? Is that the best place to get it? All, all good bookshops and anywhere online. Should be a bestseller, no question. <laughs> <laughs> After the Woman's Hour, it very, very briefly was on Amazon, very briefly, and then <laughs> toppled off. Extraordinary. Uh, we're going to just take one more question here. What would you say was the most revealing vision? There were 16 visions, weren't there, or showings? Well, most. Oh, <laughs> I don't know. Um, let's choose. They're all they're all amazing. Um, I mean, one one that comes to mind is right at the beginning when she has a vision of Mary, the mother of Jesus, at the time of conception, <clears throat> and she she uh, even as she's conceiving, and Julian has this sense that what. She's, why do the visions come to me? Why did Christ come to be born in this slender young woman? 
and it's something that uh, God comes to those who who know they are nothing because there's room. <laughs> <laughs> yes. There's one. Yes. Okay, well, um, congratulations, Claire, on uh, what I think is really a superb book. And, you know, I also, it took me to reading Revelations of Divine Love directly, which I presume is what you'd also like for people to go to Julian directly. But it, it's a wonderful, wonderful read. And uh, as I say, it, it's a great page turner. So thank you so much for joining us this morning. And uh, best of luck with sales of the book. <laughs> thank you very much. It's been a privilege to be with you. <clears throat> so thank you all for watching and uh, we will be back next Friday with Philosophy Live. So uh, do leave us some comments and uh, we look forward to being back next week. Thank you so much. Bye for now.